All right, everyone. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, today, uh, I wanted to take us on a walkthrough of um, using some of the tools to analyze a uh, EXE, so a backdoor that I compiled uh, from some source code. So I posted an announcement um, that, uh, oops, I'm not going to open up the Google Drive link, but you can actually download a copy of it from here. Um, I use the same password. I forgot to put it on here, but I use the same password um, as before. So it's this password, CS6038, um, on the zip file. Um, mainly just do that because if I upload zip files of malware to UC's Instructure site, um, chances are that some antivirus thing on there is going to come along and uh, destroy it before you all get to download it. So if I encrypt it, um, oftentimes it hides it from the AV. <clears throat> so um, one of the nice things about this one is that the source code is in here. It's all one big file. So, um, you know, something where you'll actually kind of have a, like, reference set of notes um, to look at um, alongside the analysis. So um, I'm going to go ahead and um, load up my Kali VM which is this one right here. Um, I've installed a number of the, um, or, or I've installed like a copy of the, or not installed, but I've copied a copy of the back door on here. Um, so, <clears throat> but uh, like always, if you want to, if you want to bring in a copy of it that you've downloaded on your machine or anything in here, um, you can click on the little folder here and then you can mess with the shared folders. <coughs> And then um, there is a mount command, like this one right here, that I used to basically mount uh, whatever directory name I gave it uh, inside the Kali image. Um, so in this lecture, um, we'll cover a handful of um, static analysis tools, but we'll focus mostly on um, uh, you know, on the like disassembly and stuff like that. And so, let me double check and see if uh, this actually works for the tool. Yeah, it does. Awesome. So that means that the version that you all have of this program will read. Uh, the Windows file. So kind of what I'm doing here is um, I just wanted to test to make sure that the Linux tools on here um, had the libraries that were necessary for analyzing a uh, Windows binary because they're two different operating systems um, uh, so that I don't have to ask you all to install something extra. So looks like that's all set up. Um, so the first thing that I'll start with um, a lot of times is uh, you know, um, is this a strings program? So um, this is like a simple, like lightweight tool that some of you might have uh, might have encountered. Um, and others who haven't, what it does is it basically looks. Um, I'm actually going to do this. So hex dump is another one. So maybe we'll start with hex dump. Um, so what hex dump does. Um, is hexdump will show you a hexadecimal listing of all the bytes in the file. And this is probably a good way to, or way to start, just to kind of give you an idea of how the thing's laid out. Um, so I'll start with this, um, because then I can point to the elements within hexdump's output um, to show you how strings is uh, finding the handful of data that it's going to display. So with hexdump, what I will do is I'll look at the exe So something like this, right? And let me, uh, oops. I'll actually make it nice and big for everyone to see. So hopefully that's viewable. So, whoops. Hmm. My bad, I hit the wrong. <laughs> I hit one key over, sorry. Um, so that should be a capital C like that, right? 
So sorry about that. <clears throat> so what hex dump does is it shows you from the beginning of the file, which is these characters up here, um, and it shows you what amounts to 16 um, 16 byte uh, rows. So there's eight bytes here, and there's eight bytes here. Um, that makes it really handy to kind of number these going down. Um, so the number across is always going to be this first number here. The number down is always going to be counted, counting you know these numbers. Um, so that's hexadecimal notation that you're probably all familiar with. So I won't get into uh, specifics. Um, the nice, uh, the neat thing about this is that it shows you um, what's in here. So we'll start with this. Um, this is uh, what's called like the MS DOS header. So uh, for uh, Windows executables, and this is very Windows specific um, uh, detail. Um, <clears throat> all Windows programs are written so that they can, uh, or I should say, so that they, if they are run under DOS, they will execute as a program without causing the OS to crash, and they'll display this little message here. So kind of in a nutshell, what you have is there's some code that's hidden in here. And that code is supposed to, if it's running DOS, um, execute on the CPU and then write this handy little message to output and then exit cleanly, um, which kind of gives you two things. So number one, there's machine readable code in here somewhere. And um, as you can see, I selected this little section here that's about, um, I think like maybe like 50 some bytes, 54 bytes, 50 bytes, something like that. Um, it tells you um, that <clears throat> there's machine readable code in here somewhere and then there's human readable code because you need to have the human readable code embedded in the exe somehow in order for it to be displayed by the exe for the person to read. Um, all Microsoft Windows programs have something like that um, and it's usually denoted by this little MZ. So that's kind of telling Windows that that's the uh, beginning of the DOS section of the file. Um, in addition, anything that's supposed to run in Windows, so it's supposed to be a, a program that uses the like 32-bit uh, Windows interface and it's not just a DOS um, program, um, also will have a separate header um, that's shortly after it that's called the PE header, and this is the actual file type. Um, when you hear um, Microsoft Windows files referred to as um, PE or portable executable, that's what they're referring to here. Um, so for instance, if I was to quit this really quick, um, I can run the file command. Um, so file command is really helpful in Linux as well um, because it its library has a whole database of different file formats. Um, so a lot of times um, I'll encounter a file that I got from somewhere. It doesn't have an extension on it. Um, and not all file types have that really handy detail where there's um some magic string at the beginning of the file that tells you what it is. Um, the Linux file command will actually go and walk in the file. Whoops. Will actually go and walk in the file and it'll try and tell you what file type it is. And sometimes it'll even go further to tell you, say, in this case, it's an executable. So it's supposed to have CPU readable code in it. Um, so it actually goes into the file metadata to figure out, okay, what type of CPU um, does this executable say it's supposed to run on? That's actually embedded in there somewhere in one of the uh, non-zero bytes. Um, then also, what operating system is it for? Um, so a good example is uh, EXE files, not just um, for Windows, also for DOS, as some of you might be familiar, the old command line operating system that Microsoft made. Um, there's also another operating system that IBM made once called OS2 um, that has its own EXE format as well and uh, the file command would identify each one of those, right? <clears throat> so there's another tool. Um, I don't have it installed on here, unfortunately, um, but I'm gonna demo it to you anyways. Um, you can install it yourselves. Um, I won't expect um, a whole lot of uh, uh, work with this tool, but um, I figured I'd demo it to you anyways because it's very handy. It's called um, Exif tool. Um, so originally, um, this tool is designed to look, or was originally designed to take apart image files and look at the um, the metadata that your camera will write into the image file for your digital camera. Um, turned out that that was a very um, 
that was a very generic recipe for reading metadata from any file. Um, so the author of this tool decided, hey, I'll make it not just for images, I'll make it for any file format that has um, extra metadata in it. Um, so um, exif tool you'll see not just for exif data, which exif is the metadata that's stored in image files. Um, it's for pretty much any file format as well. So what you saw here was we were able to look at the binary data with hex dump. Uh, then we were able to use the file program, which uses its database of file types to extract a little bit of metadata. So the next thing is the exif tool program. We'll actually go through and do a much more thorough investigation of the file's metadata um, to try and get some more uh, information about the file and report it to you. So I use this one a lot. Um, I'll use this and the file command a lot um, to try and get different details about the um, you know, contents that a file might have uh, if I want to analyze it. Um, so in this case, it goes through. Um, it pulls some information that it managed to get off of the uh, file system. So this isn't necessarily stored, or I should say this is not necessarily stored inside the file. This is the metadata on disk. Um, so uh, from, uh, from, say, last week's lecture, you remember we looked at the master file table and investigated it. The master file table tracked a bunch of different timestamps in the file uh, system itself. Um, that's kind of what you're looking at here. Um, however, the stuff that file was reporting is uh, basically right, mostly right here. Um, and then there's a number of other things in here as well. So um, a really good example is um, this right here um, is the timestamp. Uh, so you can see that that timestamp is from earlier today. It looks like um, it's about, say, an hour ago or something like that. So that's when I last compiled this program. Um, so when I use um, the C compiler, whether it's GCC or CLang or uh, Visual Studio C compiler, um, the C compiler will embed the timestamp that I compiled and built that file. And it'll embed that in there um, in the file for you. Um, it goes and talks about some flags that were set at build time. Um, again, it shows the PE type, the linker version, so that uh, information is all embedded in there. Um, so if I'm looking at a directory full of exe files that came from somewhere, um, or maybe they, I'm told that they came from many different places, um, I might actually be able to look in there to try and see, say, if version numbers match up. You know, different people may use different tools um, or different tool chains or different versions of a compiler to build things. Um, that information is all embedded in here as well. Um, <clears throat> it tells me where the entry point is. Um, does anyone want to guess what the entry point is on here? What that? Yep. Yeah, exactly. So the entry point, um, that's going to be the first location in the program uh, where executable code exists. So it's telling Windows that when you load this file and you get all of its data in memory, what you need to do next is you need to jump to this location within the file and start executing whatever bytes happen to be there in the CPU. Uh, so with that knowledge, I know that um, within this file, there's likely to be, uh, you know, there's likely to be some executable code at least in that location in the file. So and then it tells you which operating system, uh, and in this case uh, for Windows, um, what it's telling you is the, um, the minimum OS version that this is supposed to run on. Um, so this is saying that uh, this program should be compatible um, as far back as uh, Windows NT4. Um, that doesn't necessarily guarantee that, the, um, uh, that it's going to be using library calls and everything like that that are compatible with the libraries that come with Windows NT4, but it means that um, the file format and file structure itself um, should at least be parsable by Windows NT4. Uh, so, but yeah, it's got a large number of these things. And then finally, um, the subsystem, it says Windows command line. Um, so Windows allows you to set a flag inside of the executables that tell it whether it's supposed to run from the command line. So it may not necessarily be a DOS program, but a Windows program running from the command line. Um, so like PowerShell.exe is a really good example of a, um, of a program that you typically run from the command line 
um, but it's not a uh, Windows program. So, yep. So I'm bring this back up, and um, one thing we can try and do is we can maybe look at the code that's at this location. So. Yeah, so you can see that there's, you know, some stuff here. So, um, anyhow, what we will do um, next is, um, you know, so we've looked at it with some um, with some metadata analyzers. Um, the next thing I'll do is um, this OBJ dump tool. So um, this is another uh, helpful tool, and I'll just put it in here. Um, Do that. Let's see. I'll go and look at something like this. So, you know, OBG dump. Um, basically, you can give it a file uh, executable of some sort, and it's going to go and do some. Yes. Could you remove this? Oh. Yeah. There. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, that looks better. Uh, thanks. The uh, projector cuts stuff off, I guess. So anyway, um, OBJ dump uh, will basically go and inspect the file, um, and it's looking for um, it's looking for a bunch of metadata that's specific to executable files. So what I might want to do is run the same command that was on that web page that I just showed you. And it goes through and it pulls out some of the same um, data um, uh, that we saw earlier. So you'll see that uh, one of the interesting things is that the start address here is um, described differently than it was in the previous um, in the previous output from exif tool. And the reason for this is that um, when you load a program into memory, it doesn't just load the program uh, file into, say, memory address zero, and then overwrite everything from there. Um, what it does is um, the program actually consists of a number of uh, sections. Each one of those sections has a designated memory address that it's supposed to be loaded to in memory, and that's all embedded within the executable. Um, <clears throat> this, is telling, this is telling the operating system that uh, when the program gets loaded into memory, um, the program should uh, jump to this uh, this location uh, in the program memory uh, or virtual memory footprint. So um, this is like a little terse kind of short, you know, dump of header information. There's a lot more information in the file, and so if I want to look at the detailed information, oops. I'll use the dash X instead of the dash F option. So the dash F option just shows you some of the file format information. The dash X option goes and gives you a lot more detail about what's going on. So you can see again that the address of entry point is listed here. Um, and then it tells you um, the base of the code and the base of the data are here, and then the image base. So the image base is um, the location in memory uh, that the program is supposed to be installed at. So this program uh, has a number of relative addresses like this. So this is an address where um, it's really um, an addition uh, or an offset, if you will. Um, so it's what they call an offset, which is that this many bytes from some starting location is where the entry point is supposed to be. This is the starting location. So when you tell Windows to load this program into memory, it's going to assume, or it's telling Windows that all addresses are going to be um, relative to this particular address. Um, 
there is a, I'm going to go down here. Give me a second. Here we go. Give me one second and I will try to find the, here we go. I just tabbed over it. <clears throat> so um, each program in Windows uh, consists of a number of sections that are strung together. Um, so, and we'll kind of get into this um, detail about files um, later on. Um, I think like next week or something like that when we start carving up uh, different file formats. Um, but most files themselves have structures. So just like you'll have a data structure that you put together um, that may have like a character array in it, it may have like an integer array in it, it might have a string in it or something like that. Um, file formats, um, pretty much all of them, uh, work the same way where they're internally they have little sections or little uh, chunks of data. So in this case, um, the sections header here describes uh, all of the different sections within this file. It tells me <clears throat> what virtual memory address, so what um, you know CPU memory address um, that this should be loaded at uh, when it's loaded off disk. It tells me what offset within the file. So this, for instance, is uh, so many bytes uh, after the beginning of the file. Um, this is telling me that the text section, which is typically where all of your executable code is, um, starts at this offset uh, within the file on disk. So uh, 400, which is, a th uh, I think, like a 1024. So like uh, one kilobyte um, into the file is that. Uh, it also tells me that uh, the amount of data that's in there is right here. So the size is this. So you can see in some cases, the size is really small. Like this one's um, just a little bit over 50 bytes. And then this one is um, something like, you know, six times four kilobytes. So whatever that uh, comes out to. Um, this one ends up being a lot of data. So they have all these different sections that are strung together and stored in the file in these different places. They also don't even really need to be, um, they also don't even really need to be in sequence, right? Um, so they could hypothetically be in any order within the file. Um, so uh, if you ever have to like take apart a uh, executable file, um, this data will, you know, will be useful in trying to kind of restructure the program or figure out, um, you know, figure out where stuff belongs in the, in the program. So um, outside of that, um, it dumps the, uh, the symbol table. So the symbol table is the, um, all the different variables and function names and things like that that are encoded within the file. Um, I actually did um, two versions of this file. Um, so I took a, and actually I'll just do this to make a full copy of it again, um, because I wanted to demonstrate uh, one of the common um, things that you'll run into. So we're analyzing a backdoor uh, that I compiled. Um, I left a lot of the debugging symbols install in place and things like that. A lot of the stuff that you may run into in the wild will have those things uh, removed with a tool like Strip. Um, Strip is basically, a, let me see, if, yeah, I have a copy of it here. Strip is basically a um, tool that's designed to remove a whole bunch of um, the debugging and other symbol information that's not really necessary uh, in a program that you plan on distributing to users. So in this case, you can see that if you run it on here, and I'll just run ls again so you can see it's the same size, right? Um, if you run that, you end up shrinking the file to about 25% of the size that the compiler originally output it at. Um, so that's really helpful for someone who's trying to distribute any software, whether they're trying to distribute malware to people and they want to keep the attachment size small, um, or they're trying to distribute a software program to you. Um, the problem with that is that if I
look at that version of the file. I end up having a symbol table that says no symbols. So all of the symbol information and all the information in there that the debugger would use to try to um, uh, connect the different code points in that file to the source code that you authored it from um, or to help you di uh, diagnose errors within the program, all that stuff has been removed. Um, and that stuff apparently is, you know, consists of about 75% of the data that was stored in this uh, file when it came out of the compiler. So um, anyhow, what we'll do is we'll go back here and I'll jump back down to that section just to kind of show you what it has right here. So that's uh, one key giveaway is if, uh, if um, you're looking at EXE and there is data in the symbol table here, that likely means that there will be a lot of breadcrumbs that will give you some insight um, when you're trying to navigate the contents of the file. So, so one more thing um, with uh, with OBJ dump, uh, and then we'll be done. Um, so if you remember, um, I'll actually do dash f again. If you remember, we have the start address right here. So I'm going to save that. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass OBJ dump the dash capital S option. <clears throat> what that does is it actually runs all the machine code. So it goes through the file. It looks through, um, if I remember correctly, it looks through the code to try and find the um, to basically try and find the executable code within the program and it disassembles it for you. So you can see it like this. Um, so that entry point that we gathered is right here. And so this basically says that the entry point <coughs> run uh, basically runs a uh, a um, operation where it stores or it subtracts, say, this value, which is 12, from one of the registers. Um, this is a common thing that you'll see in analyzing x86 code, um, and we'll see it a lot in the um, Ghidra disassembly that I'll get to in a little bit. Um, but I kind of wanted to work us up to that to try and see the different um, tools and different components um, that get us there. Um, so um, one of the common uh, things that um, x86 code will do is they'll adjust the stack pointer uh, to make room for, say, temporary variables to be stored on the stack um, or on the heap, if you will. Um, so, you know, <coughs> people use either terminology to describe the same concept, um, but for the mo most part, it's basically local data uh, storage that's set up um, ahead of um, or I should just say like right uh, before, say, moving forward with executing code. Um, so you'll see this commonly um, in, a, in the beginning of a lot of functions and stuff like that. Um, and basically what they're doing is they're trying to determine um, that will actually be chosen, this number will be chosen by the compiler, and oftentimes will vary depending on, say, the number of local variables you have in a function or something like that. So then the next thing I can do <clears throat> is uh, I can, you know, I have another address here. Um, or actually, I'll look at this one because this one's actually calling code. I don't know exactly what that one's doing. Um, so I have another address here um, that I can jump to if I want. And it's right here. And so right here, what you end up seeing is, again, that um, setup of the ESP register. So the stack register, again, is adjusted uh, to make room for some local temporary storage on the stack that the function's going to use. Um, this is actually a really nice one because uh, you can actually see the entire function on screen. 
uh, in one page. So uh, the structure of this function is basically uh, comprised of three components. Uh, what you end up having is you end up having what's called the preamble. So um, the code that this function has um, to try and set up the memory space and set up the register space for the code that the author wrote. And that's this one. It ends but includes the subtraction instruction that's right here. So the next port, the next part of the uh, function is uh, the actual function implementation, or you know what I would largely call um, the code that the um, the code that the author wrote. So this is the code um, that the uh, function author wrote. Um, I will say there's one little key piece to keep in mind um, that you just have to keep in mind here is that there is a jump inside of this code um, to go and branch down here. So there's another portion of the function that continues down below, um, which we can get to. Um, but this, this segment of the function right here is a real good example. So this code right here would, um, these, what is it, seven instructions? So these seven instructions, that implements basically code that the author wrote. Um, the rest of this stuff is um, down here is the return code. So when the function returns back to the function that called it, the function that called it expects that um, all of the memory is still, re you know, is still as it left it. So whatever this function does up here to mess with registers and stuff like that, whatever this function does up here um, to try and set up the memory space, um, it's also saving a copy of all of the CPU registers that it's going to use in doing whatever math that it has to do. And the reason why it's doing that is so that it can restore all of it back to the way it came in. So you can think of it like, you know, enter, enter a room for the day or something like that, uh, like a uh, CPU is a lot like a, um, like a shared workspace or something. You know, you go in, you lay your stuff out on the table, um, you start, you work for eight hours or something, or you work for four hours. Um, then, before you leave, you don't just leave the mess on the table. You clean everything up and you restore it back to the, you know, the state that it was before you got there. Um, so that everyone who uses it ends up having a, um, a similar experience, um, doesn't have to do extra cleanup, and also doesn't have any random, unexpected things happen that might disrupt um, their day. So the same is true here. Um, if you are, you know, if your function goes and does anything productive, it needs to make sure that when it is done doing that, it returns back to the previous function, that it restores everything back the way it was. And there's no native capability for that in the processor. Um, it's up to the compiler to actually add that code uh, in order to make it happen. And so that's what you'll see here. And when you're going and analyzing many different functions within a uh, program, you'll end up seeing this pattern repeat over and over again, where you have your function broken up into three different parts. Um, now I'll um, stop here for a moment and see if there's any, uh, any questions from anyone. Um, if there's anyone curious about anything? <coughs> yeah. Yes, yeah, that's exactly correct. So the jump on equal, um, and that'll be the next thing I talk about, um, how the uh, x86 processor works. Um, another thing that you may encounter um, if we do get into analyzing um, different architectures is that the, um, the condition, what's called a conditional jump, or a jump that only happens if some condition is true or false, um, that convention may vary from processor to processor. For these particular CPUs, um, what it does is it does a comparison here. Um, I'll have to remember exactly. It's either a it either performs an AND like a bitwise AND or a bitwise uh, or a um, or a arithmetic subtraction. I can't remember which one. Um, so I can actually show you really quick. Um, so compare two operands. 
this is really helpful. Um, what it'll do is it'll compare them. Yeah, so it does a subtraction. So right here, what CMP does is it's a is it really does a subtraction behind the scenes, so it uses the subtraction logic within the processor to do a comparison. Um, and then it throws away the result, so it doesn't actually save the result anywhere. Um, but it looks at the result before it throws it away and then uses that to try and set a number of state flags within the processor. And that's these things here. So um, when the subtraction happens here, uh, if the result is zero, uh, then it sets what's called the zero flag in the processor, which basically says that um, there's a flag that turns on or off um, any time you do a mathematical operation and the end result is zero. So if the end result is zero, the zero flag set. So really, um, jump if equal, you know, as you were saying, um, that basically does a, a, a equal a equality comparison test. Um, but also what it's doing is it's really testing for the zero flag. So sometimes you may see that reflected as like a JZ for jump if zero. Um, and so that's just something worth keeping in mind as well. Um, so then, you know, we'll go down here and then that segment of the program starts down here. And what you can see is that this segment of the program oops, ends up being a long series of, um, uh, it does kind of load effective address. So this is a, um, <clears throat> uh, this is basically a operation that um, computes a uh, memory address to store, so it computes a pointer for you, um, stores it in the EAX register, and then um, what this does is it ends up storing that pointer on the top of the stack uh, somewhere before it calls this. So it's basically passing it as an argument um, to this function. Um, and so then largely um, you'll see that. So um, you'll see a lot of these kind of move instructions that put something on the stack um, ahead of uh, function calls. And so then that's the last, um, you know, that's a, the next thing that we'll um, talk about very briefly is that um, in order to call a function that takes many different arguments, um, there's no kind of native way for passing arguments in the CPU uh, to happen. Uh, so really a lot of different operating systems and a lot of different environments uh, handle that in different ways. Um, Sometimes it'll be apparent and something like Ghidra will be able to identify it and tell you what it is. Um, other times you'll have to try and deduce that for yourself. Um, and so then that's the, uh, um, you know, so that's the next thing that we have to, um, that, you know, we won't spend a whole lot of time on that, but that's like, you know, the next uh, piece of information that, you know, I feel is like really useful is, <coughs> that each one of these calls, you can see they don't come with function arguments being passed to them, right? But each one of these functions may or may not have one or more arguments um, to pass to it. Um, so you'll see different movements that'll either put it in registers um, or some move calls that'll put it on the stack um, or somewhere like that um, that are responsible for trying to get uh, arguments into functions. So. I'm going to try and see if I can, uh, yeah. So then you can see, again, we repeat that sequence of steps um, before we return back to the previous function. So remember this was jumping, so there's a copy of all that return logic. So even though you may have like one return within your program, um, when the compiler pushes it all out, um, they're going to duplicate that kind of cleanup code um, every time, uh, every place that your program, every place that your function can exit. Um, and then you can see there's another jump if equal that goes to this 40600, which is down here. So this ends up, you know, you can kind of see what's going on here. So it is doing some tests. If some tests um, fails. Uh, again, remember we're looking at the code. Uh, the place we started here is actually the entry point for the program, right? So it's the first um, function that's supposed to be executed by the program, meaning that 
any of the returns that we've encountered when we've been looking through it are supposed to return us back to um, back to where we started. So or basically back to the OS. So <clears throat> in a nutshell, the three things that are really, really helpful, you know, to keep in mind for OBG dump is dash F, dash lowercase x, and dash s. Um, I think I'm just going to look at uh, one other thing. Yeah. Oh, I know what it is. So then, um, what I'm going to do, so I was showing you the uh, that file that I had stripped all the debugging information out. Um, so now we can take a look at... Um, I'll actually give it the same argument just to show you. So these are different ways of showing the source code or the listing, right? Um, so if I give it the version of the file that still has all the debugging symbols, then OBJ dump will actually break all of the different um, functions up uh, and then display them to me as individual discrete um, segments of code, which is really helpful. Um, and then... Kind of this concept is what a tool like Ghidra is built on, uh, is that um, the functions will be extracted. Uh, Ghidra will actually go even further, and uh, I'll go ahead and load it up now. So for any of you who um, you know who are trying to follow along, um, I installed Ghidra on here, and I actually put menu options in here, so you don't have to try and find it on the hard drive. Um, so if you click on this section 07, reverse engineering, um, I actually have Ghidra right here. <clears throat> and um, it'll take a little bit of time to load up because it's a Java application, so those tend to be um, rather large. Um, but once it comes up, and there it is, um, Ghidra uh, operates from the concept of a project. So um, if I'm an analyst who is tasked with trying to analyze all the malware for an attack, um, chances are that if an adversary broke in, they didn't just use the back door and then do everything with that one piece of code. Um, chances are they used the back door um, and then they uploaded some other tools and they may have uploaded other back doors. So doing analysis of a system that is compromised, um, I may end up having like 10 or 20 different tools that I have to go and analyze. So what Ghidra is, Ghidra set up for that type of analysis problem um, so what Ghidra has is the concept of project. So I'll say that, you know, this is like week four project, right? So I'll say this is the week four analysis project. Um, after I've created a new project, what I can do is I can import file. Um, it also has a shortcut key, so if I just hit I, the I key on my keyboard, it'll pop up the... Um, the import uh, dialog. It'll take a little bit of time to import. Um, so what Ghidra does is it uses some of the same logic that I demoed for you earlier on the command line to try and get the file metadata. Um, it uses that to try and determine what type of file it is, and then it presents that to you. It gives you the option to maybe choose a different interpretation of the file. So if the file had, um, and here I'll, I'll show you, um, if I click on the little information there, it actually shows me all of the different file formats that it is capable of analyzing. But in the drop-down here, it'll only give me the ones that it thinks are a match for the particular file. So I may run into files that do match, say, more than just two of these, right? Um, and it will give me the option to choose any one of those. Um, I can also go through here and... Um, It'll try and determine what, which compiler was used to generate the program. Um, so it looks like it automatically chose Visual Studio. Uh, we'll leave it at that. I did compile it with GCC, I think. Um, but for whatever reason, or actually, I think it just picked the default. Um, so yeah. Um, but for whatever reason, that's what it chose. Um, there's some options as well um, that you can that you can choose and you can uh, read about these. Uh, one of the helpful or one of the useful ones that I found 
um, is this load external libraries. Um, so a lot of times if I'm dealing with a piece of malware and um, I pulled it off of a Windows XP computer or we'll say a Windows uh, you know, Windows 8 computer or something, Windows 8.1, um, and I'm analyzing it on my Linux computer. Um, <clears throat> I may navigate different code paths within that program uh, that then call to DLLs, the dynamic link libraries, so the DLLs in Windows that a lot of the shared code lives in, um, but I don't have them on my Linux machine. Um, Ghidra has a nice feature that allows me to actually, if I have a copy of those stored in a directory somewhere, um, Ghidra will actually uh, allow me to tell it where that folder is, and then I can help my analysis further um, by pointing this program at, uh, at that uh, area. So it'll really help me with like navigating it. Um, I'm not going to do that today because I don't have a copy of all that stuff there, um, but just to let you know if you want to play with something, um, that can probably help answer a lot of uh, questions really quickly that may take, that may otherwise take a lot of uh, analysis work to try and track down. So I'll go ahead and bring this in. Um, it gives me a little dialog that tells me, you know, so see, here you go, unable to find those external libraries we were talking about. Oops. All right, so as you can see, um, <clears throat> the other thing that's nice about Ghidra is it'll pick up um, where you left off as far as the projects go. So whatever project you were just working on when you closed it, um, that's the project that it's going to open when you load it the next time. So um, I double clicked on the exe here. Um, it's going to go through and um, use all the settings that I gave it earlier. Would I like to analyze it now? I'm going to click yes. Analyze. You'll notice that there's a handful of um, analyzers that are read here. Um, so a lot of times those are analyzers that are that either take a long time to run, um, or they're considered prototype analyzers. So they might um, they might run into a situation where they might crash the whole program or something like that. So they're kind of still in development. Um, so for those of you who might have uh, gone and read some of the Ghidra, now, or the Ghidra documentation on their website, um, it was an NSA tool. NSA um, had been using it for years or maybe even over a decade or something like that, um, uh, basically for like you know secret malware research. Um, they open sourced it last year. Um, and now they host the open source project on GitHub, and it's still under active development. So it's actually had a like I think like four or five uh, releases since then. Um, so and things like this are what um, they're working on, and they also accept contributions from the public. So um, this is the stuff that um, I was trying to get it to show you last time, and. Um, the UI kind of froze up on us, but you can see as long as this hourglass is going on down here, um, that means that um, there's still um, auto analysis work being done in the background. Um, so a lot of times you'll wait for that to, um, you know, to complete. So once it's completed, you'll get an auto analysis summary. Um, this basically has, you know, runs down and you know says cannot find type infrastructure, so it couldn't find RTTI, so there's none of that data in there, um, et cetera. And then it presents you basically with the beginning of the file. And you can see that this right here is the beginning of the file. If you still have in your memory the hex dump that we were looking at, um, this is the same data that was there. And you can see the string copy of it's right here. So one of the things that's really neat about Ghidra as well is that um, <clears throat> it allows you to navigate the file um, in this kind of like hierarchical, hierar hierarchical, hierarchical way. Uh, excuse me. Um, <clears throat> so this shows you what the raw bytes for this um, kind of block of data are. Um, and then what Ghidra did is it went in there and it tried to come up with um, different data types that might actually be representing it. So you can see these two bytes here are also reported as a string right here. And then they're also reported as a character array right here. Um, so you can see how they would look in all of those different, um, you know, in all those different layouts. You can see the exact same effect here and here and here. 
So that can become very helpful if you're trying to analyze binary data and you want to see, um, say, a data structure that's embedded within the program. You want to see how um, the, maybe the different uh, variations that it can look um, because, you know, as people, when we're doing the analysis, part of the reason why so much malware analysis is human-driven is because um, a lot of times something's only obvious to us if we're kind of looking at it and looking at two different options side by side. Uh, we can usually pick out the best option. Um, so uh, one thing I'm going to do right now, so we don't have to run this again if Giger crashes, is I'm going to save it with a save button here. Um, so Giger never saves anything automatically for you behind the scenes. So you have to do that. Um, and later on, we may um, get into exercises where we're adding notes and comments in here. Um, you'll want to make sure that every time you're doing that type of thing, you're saving it. Um, but the, one of the things to save is that Ghidra ran all those auto analyzers, and that's all displayed to me in this window here. Um, but none of that stuff has been saved to disk by default yet. I have to manually save it. So up here in the uh, what I think is called the uh, program trees, um, this is the section list that we were just looking at with OBJ dump. So this thing is used that data and kind of represented it in a way that uh, gives us the ability to navigate it. Um, the other thing that it has is it has uh, the imports table. Um, so when I told you earlier that a program is going to use um, say whatever DLLs come built into Windows plus maybe some other DLLs that are distributed with the program, um, they're usually using functions um, or data variables that are in those uh, DLLs. Um, so this allows you to explore what functions from each one of the DLLs um, might be used by, uh, by the program. So this can kind of give us some insight about um, say what the program does or what features the program has. So in this case, uh, and I'll say that um, the way that the compiler works is that it's only going to link up the function names that are actually used by code that was compiled in the, in the program. Uh, so in this case, the winInet.dll file has many functions in it, but there's only four of those functions that are actually used in here uh, one of them is FTP put file A. So there's some code somewhere in here that I can reasonably guess um, uploads files using the FTP file transfer, file transfer protocol. Um, in addition to that, it uses the Internet Open A, Internet Connect A, and Internet Close Handle. Um, so I'll jump out here with a web browser really quick just to do... A quick look up. So um, one of the handy things that Microsoft put together is um, like Microsoft's really good at documenting things, um, and so the sites like this will become your best friend when you're trying to analyze what different code does. Um, but also, Microsoft is also just as they are good at documenting things, they are also good at making the world's longest function definitions. Um, so you can see here there is at least like there's eight arguments that this function takes. In order to connect from one, in order to connect to a server on the internet, which means that any time this function is called, you're going to have Ghidra showing you eight different variables that you might need to track down. And so documentation like this will be helpful in telling you which one of those eight variables is the server name that it's trying to connect to, which one is the server port which one's the username, and then most valuable of all, which one's the password for that server. And um, just kind of a other piece here that's helpful is opens file transfer protocol or HTTP session. So this one function is compatible with both of those different protocols. So also I can guess that because they're using this to upload files using the FTP file transfer protocol, they're probably using this or this, maybe both of these, to open a connection to it.
So the other thing that we have in here is we have functions. And this one right here, you might remember this address. So it's marked as entry um, right here. Um, that may not necessarily always be the case, um, but I do believe that it's usually, uh, if not always, highlighted in purple or pink like this. Um, that's basically the uh, the entry point function. Um, so if I wanted to walk this program from like the absolute beginning to the end, I could start there. However, uh, as many of us who've had to do like C and C++ development over the years are familiar, um, there's other function names as well um, that are valuable. Uh, and I'm trying to see if I can find it. So oh, it's not listed on here, but anyway, yeah. So um, the main function is another one that's uh, that's valuable as well, um, which I was trying to find. Um, but I will be totally honest. Um, if you remember, I stripped all the symbols from this executable. That probably eliminated the main function. That doesn't mean that all hope is lost. Um, that just means that it makes our our job a little bit more difficult. So then this is where the um, strings program can come in handy. So that strings program that I kind of teased everyone with earlier, um, we can look at that uh, really quick. So I put it in week four. We'll look at the underscore s version again. Um, so one of the interesting things is that you'll see there's this welcome to revolution right here. And there's all of these little strings that are kind of broken up into little chunks like that, which is interesting. Um, what I may want to do is I may actually want to look at the strings that are maybe at least a certain length or longer. So maybe, oh, whoops, I think it's dash n. Yep. So if I want to look at the ones that are maybe like six characters or longer, um, I can use dash n. So one of the things looking through the program like this um, is I can see that there's a whole bunch of whoops, these strings right here. So there's one that's called system info or sysinfo. Um, there's one that's unnamed or unnamed D or whatever. I don't know if that's supposed to say unnamed and it just misspelled or not. There's a test one, two, three, a screenshot, there's get hostname. Um, so I might be interested in trying to determine what each one of those things are. Um, so um, one of the things I can do in here is I can go here to window and I can look at defined strings. So you know, from my perspective, um, what's oftentimes very helpful is that because malware is built typically with the constraint that it's supposed to have a a um, operator interfacing with it on the other end, right? So there's someone else gives another person access to your computer to go and do things with it um, behind the scenes. Um, usually the interface has um, some messages, um, you know, human readable code, human interactable code, or basically a human machine interface there for you. Um, a lot of what we're seeing in this listing here with strings, which, you know, I had right here, um, is data trying to, you know, provide that access. In this case, um, I'll just kind of jump ahead. Um, these are commands that the operator can run against the back door so they can send it over the wire to the back door to have the back door go and do things. So we'll look at one of them. We'll look at the screenshot one. And so what I would do is I would go to window. I would go to define strings. So if you remember earlier, um, I was able to expand and collapse the different um, data type representations that were um, that Ghidra found. Uh, strings is a real common one because uh, we typically use those as a type in Windows um, or basically in any C program. And you can see that that <coughs> screenshot word is right here. <clears throat> and so when I highlight these, 
you can see on the left hand side, it's actually jumping and highlighting the different work, you know, the different data sections or the different data uh, fields in my program. So I can go over here and I can actually look. And um, one of the nice things about Ghidra is that when it went through and did the analysis and it found all these different strings, um, it also went through the code and tried to look in the code to find out where in the code does it refer to these strings. Because if I'm going to display a string to a user or if I'm going to compare a string to something the user gave me, chances are somewhere in that area is also where I'm going to execute the command or I'm going to do the thing that has to do with that string. So in any of these things, if I'm looking through the strings table here on the right-hand side, it's going to auto-focus where that is in the file on the left-hand side. And then it's going to tell me where the program address is. And what I did was I just hovered over it right there, and it gave me a preview. So it gives me a huge tooltip that's a preview of um, that code right there. And you can see right there, um, it actually moves the... Um, address of the screenshot into whatever this is right here. And what I can do is I can actually double click on that and it'll take me right there. If I want to go back, I can, um, so if I want to return back to the what I was looking at before, I can click the back button up here. And then if I accidentally click the back button, I didn't really want to go back or I was just checking something really quick, um, I can go forward again. So I can go back, I can, I can undo my going back. So, and the most handy feature that Ghidra has is this right here, which is um, the decompilation uh, section. So, I can click here, and basically it's going to do the, it has the same behavior here um, that you saw in the strings view, which is that my disassembly is anchored to whatever code in the decompilation. So one of the features that Ghidra has that a lot of other systems that do disassembly don't have is it'll analyze all of the assembly language for you and then it'll convert it, um, not perfectly, but typically much more readable than the disassembly was by itself into um, C code, which is what you see over here. So um, finally, you know, what you can also do is you can export the program if you want into a C program. And it'll actually take all of the decompiled functions that exist in this entire program and it'll output it um, to a C program for you. Um, you know, so if you wanted to go and try compiling it or messing with it, you could do that. So, all right, um, it is 520, 521, so class is uh, dismissed.